Um, I'm actually going to talk about uh, three somewhat related issues. Uh, hair trigger alert, as advertised. Uh, also, presidential launch authority and uh, first use options. And, and the previous speakers have touched on some of these things. Uh, so some of what I say might be a little repetitive, but some of it also bears repeating. So um, let's talk about hair trigger alert um, and launch on warning. The US has uh, about 400 weapons on missiles in silos underground in the middle of the country. And those weapons are ready to be launched 24 seven. There are people in underground uh, command posts, uh, like the picture you see here, waiting for the signal to launch. In addition, some of our submarine-based weapons are on uh, high alert. They could be launched quickly as well. But the ones I'm going to talk about today are the land-based ones, because those are the ones that really give rise uh, to, to uh, a tremendous danger. So when uh, a missile is launched anywhere in the world, uh, the U.S. detects it. Well, I should say not a very, uh, well, actually pretty short range missile. So we have two kinds of detectors. We have satellite-based sensors that pick up the plume of a missile, and we have radars in different uh, parts, different spaces around the world. And when we detect a launch, the clock starts ticking. It takes a few minutes for us to detect the launch, a few minutes for it to be processed by our computer system, a few minutes for our military advisors to try to, military personnel, to try to figure out what's going on. And in the meanwhile, the clock is still ticking. It takes less than half an hour for a long-range missile to go from the US to Russia or Russia to the US. And these missiles and silos could be destroyed by one of those incoming warheads. That is why the clock is ticking. Okay, our submarine-based warheads are not vulnerable to attack. Okay, so it's really these land-based missiles that give rise to this uh, ticking clock, shall we say. Um, so at this point, Maybe 10 minutes has passed, and it's ready if, if the uh, military decides that this is a serious alert, it goes to the president. Uh, you probably have all heard now about the nuclear football, which is this suitcase uh, carried by the gentleman here in the middle of the screen. Uh, there's somebody with the president 24-7. Uh, uh, I assume they're not actually, you know. I mean, anyway, with the president 24-7. You can figure that out. Uh, and the reason is to receive this alert in this black uh, suitcase is a book of options. So... Uh, there will be an indicate, you know, there, the, the advisors might say, we recommend option 27, but the op, you know, there are lots of options, or maybe you might think of option 54. And then you can look at what those options are, how many missiles go where. Um, you know, in some cases, I think it tells you how many people would die, does not tell you what the consequences, the climatic uh, consequences of such an attack would be. So uh, the president has about 10 minutes to make this decision before he or she has to tell the Pentagon that, yes, I want to launch these missiles. OK? Um, now, sometimes the sensors are wrong. Sometimes other things go wrong. And there have been, in the past several decades, Nuclear near misses. I'm going to touch on some of the ones we know about. I'm guessing we don't know about all of them. 
These are the ones that are um, maybe the most famous. So here's a, a situation uh, in 1979. And the US received indication that it was under a full-scale attack. It looked like just the kind of attack they would be expecting from the Soviet Union. And up goes the alert level. And they figure out that the reason it looks like an attack is because somebody has put a training tape in the computer. And the training tape is an attack. So it looks just like what they were expecting and had been training for. It did not rise to the level of the president. Here's a case in the Soviet Union in 1983. The uh, satellites, the Soviet satellites, detect what looked to be several incoming missiles. The person uh, in charge that night uh, in uh, the Soviet command center Everything checked out. It looked like a real, you know, like there was no corruption of the data. And protocol uh, called for him to tell his supervisor. And then it would have gone up from there. And based on a gut feeling, he disobeyed the rules and, and, decide, and said, oh, it's a false alarm, even though he didn't know it was a false alarm. It was a false alarm, but he didn't know that. And he was later reprimanded. Uh, there was a movie about him, uh, The Man Who Saved the World. Okay. Uh, in 95, this is now Russia, not the Soviet Union, um, Norway launched a small, what's called a sounding rocket. It was going to do some scientific experiments in the atmosphere. Um, and its trajectory looked like the trajectory of a US submarine-launched missile off the coast of Russia that might have been designed to destroy Russia's uh, early warning radars as a prelude to a larger attack. And this warning did, apparently, go up to Yeltsin. There was a dispute about whether or not uh, that actually, whether it went that far up, Yeltsin says it did. Uh, people uh, other than Yeltsin say it didn't. It's hard to imagine the president could be that confused. <laughs> right. Okay, so those are cases from the past. What about now? This is uh, a quote from a General Cartwright, who used to be the commander of all the US nuclear weapons. I'll just let you read it. But he's making the point that cyber attacks are a new unknown. We don't really know how to factor them in, but clearly, it's not going to make things better. Now, our new Secretary of Defense, before he became Secretary of Defense, said something very interesting in Senate testimony last year. He said, is it time to reduce the triad to a dyad, removing the land-based missiles? This would reduce the false alarm danger. So um, unfortunately, when he was uh, in his uh, confirmation hearings, he was really uh, pounded on this and ended up saying, oh no, I believe in the triad. But clearly, I think this reflects his, uh, his, his own assessment. Now, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily think he's going to act on it, but it's a good sign. So now I'm going to talk about the second thing that I mentioned, which is uh, using nuclear weapons first. So a lot of people think that uh, the US would use, that, that the point of US nuclear weapons is to deter. Deter what? Well, deter a nuclear attack on the United States. Deter a nuclear attack on our allies. Turns out that it's, uh, it's more complicated, OK? So, uh, our previous speaker said, uh, pointed out that, in fact, the US has used nuclear weapons first. 
in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and our policy has been that we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons first. Under the, uh, this is the second Bush administration, they, they did uh, a nuclear posture review where they looked at US policy. Uh, it was leaked, and uh, this is what it says. The US reserves the right to use nuclear weapons first against any country in response to an attack with conventional weapons or with chemical or biological weapons. And it specifically listed several countries, okay? Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, who, you know, there were no questions about Iranian nuclear program at that point, Iraq, Syria, and Libya. Now, uh, what's interesting is that this policy of first use really flourished during the Cold War when the US and, and NATO thought that Russia had conventional superior, the Soviet Union had conventional superiority, might roll into Western Europe, and that we needed nuclear weapons to be able to deter that. And in fact, at one point, the US had 7,000 tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. Okay, now there are only 200. All right, so the policy evolves under the Obama administration. Their nuclear posture review, which is not classified, you can find it online, um, says that the primary purpose, not the only, but the primary purpose, is to deter the use of nuclear weapons. And the US will not use nuclear weapons against countries that don't have them. So in other words, the US would not use them against Iraq or Syria or Libya, okay? So it would take those off the list. And in fact, the list, it didn't name these countries, but you can figure it out yourself. Uh, it would only use them against countries that have nuclear weapons. Now there are only a few that we would ever attack, uh, and they are Russia, China, and North Korea. Moreover, the goal is to have a no first use policy. Got it. Um, now, President Obama, so this was in 2010. In the last few months of his administration, there was serious consideration of adopting a no first use policy. Obama uh, was very eager to do so, actually. And one of the reasons he didn't is he got tremendous pushback from Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, Secretary of State John Kerry, and Secretary of Energy Moniz, who argued that this would send the wrong message to Russia, because there was tensions with Russia. Um, so we lost that opportunity for you know, who knows how long. So let me move on to uh, Presidential Launch Authority. Now, um, it is the president who has the sole authority to make a decision that the US will use its nuclear weapons. And I think uh, Joe uh, talked about this situation earlier, but there is a, a scary uh, historical event in which um, President Nixon uh, noted correctly, I can go back into my office and pick up the telephone, and in 25 minutes, 70 million people will be dead. Okay, he had the authority to do that. And during Watergate, I didn't know about the talking to the uh, portraits, but he was definitely uh, drinking heavily uh, in a bad way, and uh, Schlesinger told the chiefs of staff, if you get any orders, uh, come talk to me first. And that was not legal, okay? He had no authority to do that. It's unclear if, had Nixon tried to order an attack, what would have happened, okay? Now, uh, let's talk about constraining presidential launch authority. Uh, and I would, I would say there, we're gonna divide it into two parts, uh, nuclear retaliation. Now, as, so, as long as you have this launch on uh, warning option, as long as you have our missiles on hair trigger alert, 
There are only about 10 minutes to make a decision about launching those weapons. It's totally infeasible that you could include more than one person in making that decision. Okay? So as long as we have that policy, we are stuck with this one person ma making that decision. That's another reason, I think, to get rid of hair trigger alert for our land-based missiles and launch on warning options. Now, presumably, if there was a decision to use nuclear weapons first, it would not be, you know, you would have more than 10 minutes to make that decision. And that opens up the door to constraining presidential authority in that case, nuclear first use. And we've already heard there is legislation uh, restricting the First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act, uh, sponsored by Senator Markey, our own senator, and Representative Liu. One minute. Um, and it would prohibit the president from launching a first strike without congressional uh, declaration of war. And there was a uh, press conference just uh, two days ago. And you can see uh, Senator Markey there and Representative Liu um, and, and uh, a, a number of groups, including Peace Action and Union of Concerned Scientists, delivered uh, 500,000 petitions. Now, um, let's be clear. This legislation will not pass. <laughs> it will not even be voted on. But it is a useful means to have this discussion. It's a useful means to get people to talk to their office, their representatives and their Senate offices about this. And, and we go from there, okay? We have a lot of things that we need to change US policy on. We, we want to remove hair trigger for uh, land-based nuclear weapons or get rid of the land-based nuclear weapons as Mattis suggested. Uh, we, and that will open up the door to involving other people in a decision to use weapons in response to an attack. You know, even if there were an attack, you don't have to respond right away unless you're worried about losing your land-based missiles. Okay? Then we have the issue of first use options. I wouldn't say it's that we have a first use policy, but we have a policy of retaining first use options. That's a problem. And then there's the problem of presidential authority. So I just wanted to complicate it a little bit and explain to you that we have more problems than you thought we did. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you. I should say one more thing. We have on our website, and I think there'll be a few copies out there, a very short report on reducing the risk of nuclear war. You can get in our, our website if there aren't copies out there. And that's it. Thank you.